afternoon. My name is Beth Davis. And I'm Director of Education for St. Luke Institute. Welcome everyone to part three, the final presentation in the Grace and Bias, Forming Catholic Leaders Around Issues of Race webinar series. This series is a collaboration between SLI Connect, St. Luke Institute's education program and the Catholic Apostolate Center and is made possible by a gift from the Active Foundation. Many thanks to the Catholic Apostolate Center and my colleague, John Sitko for hosting the webinar today. I'm very pleased to introduce our presenter, Bishop Shelton Fobb of the Diocese of Huma Thibodeau. A native of New Rose, Louisiana, Bishop Fobb was ordained to the Diocese of Baton Rouge in 1989, was appointed Auxiliary Bishop of the Archdiocese of New Orleans in 2006, and has been Bishop of the Diocese of Huma Thibodeau since 2013. Bishop Fobb currently chairs the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops Ad Hoc Committee Against Racism, and he previously served as chair of the Subcommittee on African American Affairs. He also currently serves on the USCCB Subcommittee for Hispanic Affairs, as well as the Pro-Life Committee. There is certainly much more to Bishop Fobb's bio, but with that brief introduction, I will also say thank you, Bishop, for joining us uh, for the concluding presentation in our series. After the remarks today, he will be available for questions facilitated by John, and please feel free to submit questions throughout the remarks today. So let's begin. Thank you again, Bishop, and for everyone who joins us today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Beth. It's my honor and my privilege uh, to be here today. Perhaps if we could just start with a prayer. So let us pray. Almighty God, in your goodness, send down the power of the Holy Spirit upon each and every one of us. Help us, loving God, to open wide our hearts and to recognize our call to see the human dignity and human life that you have given to each and every person. Strengthen us to be about dismantling racism Strengthen us to be about building racial healing and reconciliation among the races. These and all things we ask through Christ our Lord. Amen. My dear friends, it's my honor to have been asked to present to you this theological reflection on the evil and the sin of racism. It is my hope that as we open ourselves to the spirit of the Lord during this presentation, that we will learn or we will be reminded of how faith calls us on the journey to dismantle racism as it might exist in our own hearts and as it exists in the structures of our society. The Catholic Church in the United States has on many occasions and in many ways addressed and worked against the evil and sin of racism. In 2018, the bishops of the United States released their most recent pastoral letter against racism, entitled, Open Wide Our Hearts, The Enduring Call to Love. Open Wide Our Hearts is a pastoral letter that calls upon us all to seek the conversion of hearts by praying, reflecting, discussing, learning, and acting to root out racism from our own hearts as well as the hearts of others. Open wide our hearts also humbly admits that through sins of omission and sins of commission, members of the Catholic Church have perpetuated the evil and sin of racism. It is only from a position of humility that the Church can approach the issue of racism. In addition to this recent pastoral letter, in 2017, the bishops of the United States established an ad hoc committee against racism. The mandate of the ad hoc committee against racism includes implementing the pastoral letter and in many ways, bringing the teaching and resources of the Catholic Church to our efforts to dismantle personal and structural racism as it exists in the church and in society. Please allow me to state two things before I continue. First, I am certain that you are aware that racism is a multifaceted evil reality that cannot be fully explained or exposed in any single presentation, such as this one. 
There is always more that can be conveyed. One of the tasks that is ours is to continue to educate ourselves on the full extent of the reality of racism. I sincerely hope that this presentation will be one source for you to come to understand the dynamics of racism and seek to join in the effort to continually root it out of our own personal interactions in society. Secondly, my dear friends, I am not an anthropologist, a sociologist, or a psychologist. There are those more competent in these disciplines, such as those who have already presented, more competent than, than I, who could give insights from these perspectives on racism. In this presentation, I will be approaching racism primarily from my own experience and competence, which is as a pastor of souls, a Catholic Christian, and a black Roman Catholic bishop in the United States. Therefore, many of my references will be from the Catholic Christian faith. I nonetheless, however, fully acknowledge that there are other faith traditions which have also added much to spiritual efforts to respond to the evil and sin of racism. So let us begin this theological reflection on racism. I want to build this reflection on the statement of Jesus Christ as conveyed in St. John's Gospel, chapter 10, verse 10b. I came so that they might have life and have it more abundantly. I came so that they might have life and have it more abundantly, which is a part of the Good Shepherd discourse found in St. John's Gospel. Obviously, Jesus Christ is speaking about the life that is available through him and the eternal life that he desires to give to us. However, I personally believe that this text can also provide us with insights into how we are called to respond to racism. I came so that they might have life, calls each one of us to desire and work for the respect for human life by working to protect and respect the physical life of others. As you are undoubtedly aware, down through history, racism has been the cause of death for countless numbers of people. And one need only recall recent events where racism can be found at the heart of the deaths of so many, especially in the black community. In spite of the advances made in civil rights legislation in our country, we continue in the present day to witness racism as the source of death of so many people. We cannot ignore this reality. Jesus proclaimed, I came so that they might have life. Racism deprives people of the gift of human life. In this regard, the bishops of the United States have unequivocally stated in open wide our hearts that racism is a life issue. And I quote, the injustice and harm racism causes are an attack on human life. As bishops, we unequivocally state that racism is a life issue, end quote. Racism can, and it does, deprive its victims of physical life. And this is its most heinous, evil, and abhorrent manifestation. Racism by the Roman Catholic Church is recognized as a life issue. However, the total manifestation of racism is not simply found in depriving others of physical life. Most people are not individually guilty of killing or murdering anyone. And therefore, most of our struggles with racism do not necessarily verge on directly depriving another of physical life. However, as is typical for most matters of faith, 
we are not let off so easily by the statement from St. John's Gospel. Returning to the statement guiding this portion of our theological reflection, we recall again the words of Jesus Christ in John's Gospel. I came so that they might have life and have it more abundantly. And have it more abundantly. In our efforts to overcome racism, we must not only respect the physical life of others, but also desire for them abundant life. What does this mean for us? Racism deprives most of its victims of abundant life, or from what I shall refer to as the basic rights and privileges owed to them because these rights and privileges flow not only from their human life, but also from their equal human dignity. Denial of their equal human dignity because of racism deprives people of life and abundant life. To show how racism deprives some people of abundant life, I want to utilize another scripture passage for our reflection. I want to use the parable of the workers in the vineyard as found in St. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 20, verses 1 through 16. The parable focuses on a vineyard owner who goes out at various times of the day from early morning to late afternoon and hires workers throughout the day to go to work in his vineyard. However, I believe a concluding part of the parable is pertinent to giving us insight into understanding an important aspect of racism, depriving people of what we are calling abundant life. The end of the parable states, and I quote, when it was evening, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, summon the laborers and give them their pay beginning with the last and ending with the first. When those who had started about five o'clock came, each received the usual daily wage. So when the first came, they thought that they would receive more, but each of them also got the usual wage. And on receiving it, they grumbled against the landowner saying, these last ones worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us, who bore the day's burden and the heat." End quote. Now, my dear friends, as with all of Jesus's parables, the real meaning of the parable is not found in the particulars of the story told, but flows from a much deeper lesson taught by the parable. This parable is not about labor relations, but about a deeper, moral and spiritual lesson. The perspective in the line that has always stood out for me is when at the time of pay, the workers hired first state, you have made them equal to us. You have made them equal to us. It is quite stunning to me that the workers hired early in the day do not state as they could, you have paid them the same amount as us. No, they question and they object to the essential value and equality of the other laborers. You have made them equal to us. Remember the line, all animals are equal, but some animals are more equal than others, which is a proclamation by the pigs who control the government in the novel Animal Farm by George Orwell. This is one of the deep, wholehearted attitudes that perpetuates racism. It is a quantification of human dignity, and we all have it, though some are found lacking. 
or all are not fully equal. Those found lacking are not worthy of the rights and privileges that flow from their equal human dignity because their equality is not recognized. Human life, human life might be recognized, but equal human dignity, a dignity equal to me? Not always so. For example, during the time of slavery, many Southern slave owners had their slaves baptized as Roman Catholics, recognizing perhaps their humanity and even recognizing that there was a soul there to save. But slaves were not of equal value as a human person. One example of this can be seen in Article 2, Section 1 of the U.S. Constitution, where an interesting, complex, and startling compromise between the slaveholding and non-slaveholding states counted slaves as only three-fifths a person. And as I understand it, Native Americans did not count at all. Furthermore, even during the time of Southern Reconstruction, the case can be made that white Southerners, after losing the Civil War, had no problem in the end with blacks being free, but they did have a problem with blacks possessing a, a, a human dignity equal to them. The Jim Crow laws, as well as other terrorizing illegal activity, all of this was to remind black people of their place of their unequal human dignity. Even though some semblance of human life might be recognized in them, they were not equal. In a similar manner, we might say that we recognize the human life of each person, but do we recognize his or her equal human dignity? equal to us and equal to all, equal to me? In this view, and open wide our hearts, the bishops state, and I quote, racism shares in the same evil that moved Cain to kill his brother. It arises from suppressing the truth that his brother Abel was also created in the image of God, a human equal to himself, end quote. In addition, the Pontifical Commission on Justice and Peace stated, and I quote, to overcome discrimination, a community must interiorize the values that inspire just laws and live out in day-to-day -day life the conviction of the equal dignity of all, end quote. So the commission says that we must interiorize the values of just laws. So just laws and what they stand for must be interiorized. And I must stand for the conviction of the equal human dignity of all. Again, we might recognize human life, but an equal human dignity and an equal human value? In Open Wide Our Hearts, the bishops wrote the following regarding racism. And I quote, racism arises when, either consciously or unconsciously, a person holds that his or her own race or ethnicity is superior and therefore judges persons of other races or ethnicities as inferior and unworthy of equal regard. Racism reveals a failure to acknowledge the human dignity of the persons offended, to recognize them as the neighbors Christ calls us to love. Consciously or subconsciously, this attitude of superiority can be seen in how certain groups of people are vilified 
called criminals or are perceived as being unable to contribute to society, even unworthy of its benefits, end quote. Sound familiar? Unworthy of the benefits of society. You have made them equal to us. They have physical life, but they are not worthy of abundant life, of the rights and privileges that are theirs because of an equal human dignity. Returning to the biblical text guiding our reflection, we recall again the words of Jesus Christ in John's Gospel. I came so that they might have life and have it more abundantly. Just as Jesus does, we should desire and work to protect not only the physical life of others, but also desire and work to assure that they have abundant life, that they have all of the rights and privileges that are theirs because of their equal human dignity. What does this mean for us today as advocates against racism? As I stated earlier, racism can and does deprive its victims of physical life. And this, as I said, is its most evil and abhorrent manifestation. However, racism also deprives its victims of abundant life or deprives its victims from the basic rights that flow from their human dignity, their equal human dignity. Racism perpetuates injustices and attitudes and is an attack against the human equality of its victims. For example, racism confines people to cycles of poverty, poor health care, poor housing, less than adequate education, further attacks against the abundant life that they deserve because of their equal human dignity. Racism perpetuates a superior view of one's self and one's own race. In Open Wide Our Hearts, the bishops state, and I quote, consciously or subconsciously, as I stated, this attitude of superiority can be seen in how certain groups of people are vilified, called criminals, or perceived as being unable to contribute to society, even unworthy of its benefit. The cumulative effects of personal sins of racism have led to social structures of injustice and violence that makes us all accomplices in racism. Too many good and faithful Catholics remain unaware of the connection between institutional racism and the continued erosion of the sanctity of life." End quote. Along with the effects of personal sins of racism, these effects of structural racism, depriving people of abundant life, are witnessed in our society today. I came so that they might have life and have it more abundantly. I want now to address a spiritual side of racism not often realized. And this is racism's effect on those who perpetuate it and embrace racist beliefs and actions. I came so that they might have life and have it more abundantly. Racism not only deprives of abundant life, those victimized by it, but racism also deprives of abundant life, those who perpetuate it. Because as stated in Open Wide Our Hearts, I quote, racism corrupts the souls of those who harbor racist and prejudicial thoughts, end quote by causing hatred for and an attack against those who are racially different. 
racism mistakenly leads those who perpetuate it to believe that they can be free of their doubts, their fears, even their misfortunes in life by believing themselves to be superior to people who are racially different from them. People who perpetuate racism and give in to its temptations do not realize that they are deprived of abundant life by the harm done to themselves by their racist thoughts and actions. They remain shackled to their sin and therefore cannot know abundant life. Jesus stated, if you remain in my word, you will truly be my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Jesus came so that all can be free, so that all can have life and have life more abundantly. We cannot participate in the abundant life available to us in Jesus Christ unless we are actively working to dismantle racism as it exists in our own hearts, in the hearts of others, in the structures and institutions of our church and our society. And open wide our hearts, the bishops state, and I quote, it is essential to understand and to help others see how racism diminishes everyone, society as a whole, and not just those who are directly affected by it. Racism negatively affects us all, even those who perpetuate it. I express my great delight that this theological reflection was included as one of the presentations in this series on racism. I think that as the church, as communities and people of faith, we do not fully recognize the important role that is ours to play in dismantling racism from human hearts and from society. Very often we think of the great challenge that is found in addressing racism. And when we think of these, we give in sometimes to the mistaken belief and the temptation to solely leave these concerns to civil law and the realm of the government to accomplish. Civil law does indeed have a very important role to play in addressing and rooting out racism. And some success, great success, has come about because of the accomplishments in civil law. In the realm of civil law, civil rights legislation enacted in the 1960s allowed us to make progress in combating racism, even though there remains still much work to do. Advancements that have come about because of civil law are important and we must continue to work to establish and strengthen them. Civil laws have increased the ability that is ours to live together or to tolerate one another. However, as people of faith, we are called to more than just tolerance. We as people of faith must understand and own that racism is not only a struggle in the realm of civil law, but racism is more tragically a spiritual and a moral challenge. It is a matter of the heart. Open wide our heart states, and I quote, racism is a moral problem that requires a moral remedy a transformation of the human heart that impels us to act. What is needed and what we are calling for is a genuine conversion of heart, a conversion that will compel change and the reform of our institutions and society." End quote. 
Racism is a moral and spiritual problem. And we as people of faith must foster this transformation of heart, a conversion of heart that will then lead to a reform of our institutions and society. The Pontifical Council for Justice and Peace recognize the important role that this conversion of heart plays in overcoming racism when it stated, and I quote, in order to eradicate racist behavior of all sorts from our societies, as well as the mentalities that lead to it, we must hold strongly to convictions about the dignity of every human person and the unity of the human family. Morality flows from these convictions. Laws can contribute to protecting basic applications of this morality, but they are not enough to change the human heart. I want to read that last line again. Laws can contribute to, protect, to protecting basic applications of this morality, but they are not enough to change the human heart." End quote. While governments can and must create laws and policies that establish and respect the civil rights of people, regardless of their race, the aspect of the struggle against racism that we as people of faith must foster is a change of human hearts. Jesus stated that from within people, from their hearts, come evil thoughts, unchastity, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, licentiousness, envy, blasphemy, arrogance, and folly. Is found in Mark's Gospel, chapter 17. I firmly believe that racism today can certainly be added to this list of things, bad things that come forth from the human heart, from within people. Therefore, my dear friends, we must seek to root out racism not only on the critical level of public policy and civil law, not only on the level of our structures and institutions, but also more importantly, on the level of the human heart. And I firmly believe we as people of faith, we as communities of faith, are in the unique position to foster the conversion of heart that is necessary to fully overcome racism. We must preach and pray and work against racism because communities of faith are uniquely qualified to bring the answer, which is conversion of hearts, to the spiritual and moral problem that is racism. As I stated in the beginning of this theological reflection, there's always more that can be said. And I have approached from a spiritual perspective our call to be about addressing racism and its many evil manifestations in our own lives, in our own hearts, and in the lives and hearts of others. For all the reasons mentioned in this spiritual presentation, this theological reflection, and for many, many more, we must acknowledge, support, and work in positive and constructive ways to advance the dismantling of racism in our own hearts, in our own homes, in our own worship communities, and in our societal structures. Jesus declared, I came so that they might have life and have it more abundantly. Racism is a life issue and people are dying because of racism. In addition to respecting physical life, the parable of the workers in the vineyard reminds us that we all have a human dignity equal 
equal to one another. Jesus reminds us that evil finds its most tragic manifestation when it takes root in our hearts and from there gets expressed in our words and actions. Racism is one such evil that can take root in our hearts. By seeking to dismantle racism in our own hearts and in the structures of our society, we can all deal justly with one another as equal. And all people can have life and have it more abundantly. Amen. And I thank you. Thank you, Bishop, for your presentation. Uh, my name is, for those who are not aware, my name is John Sitko. I'm the Assistant Director of Programs and I, for the Catholic Apostle Center. And for the next 15 or so minutes, uh, Bishop has agreed to do Q&A. Um, and so I think an important first question that a lot of people have had is this question of uh, how do we model as church leaders, because the majority, the vast majority of the people on this on this webinar are church leaders, how do we help start the process of healing and expanding and understanding racism in our parish communities? I think the first and most important thing is to have courageous conversations, to not be afraid to approach the subject. Um, you know, I think evil uh, has power over us uh, when, we, when we can't speak about it, you know, when we can't say its name, if we want to use a biblical manifestation. So I think one of the most important things that we can do is to begin to hold those courageous conversations and to to recognize that, that that is going to be uncomfortable. And as we begin those conversations, to be with people where they are. Now, some people have been involved in this battle for 40 years or better, okay? You can have one kind of conversation with them. Some people haven't even thought about racism, but if they take a step, okay, and they, they engage in a conversation or they go to a seminar or a session. You can't talk to them the way you've been talking to people who've been involved in this fight for 40 years. So I'd say to, to look for those opportunities to have courageous conversations. You know, I'm very proud of Open Wide Our Hearts. It is a pastoral letter. You know, um, it is a document issued by the bishops. It has a, 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 a study guide. You know, I think you can begin to use that study guide to open up small group discussions. So just to not be afraid to talk about it. It's a subject that makes everybody very uncomfortable. But I think one of the ways church leaders and, and, and we who are people of faith can do it is, is um, just, you know, don't be afraid to, to talk about it. Seek to encounter one another. Pope Francis is wonderful word and seek for ways to, to foster those encounters where people will, will meet those who are different from them and enter into constructive conversations. And I know this is a long answer to a very good question, but I think the church is in the unique position to do that because I am not, you know, any effort to overcome racism, I think is great. But I think when somebody knows that the Catholic Church Parish is going to have a discussion on racism. I would hope that people would feel comfortable going to that because they know what we stand for as, as a church. And I think, you know, that trust that we have with people can be a foundation building block to begin those courageous conversations. That would be my response. That is a great answer. And as a, as a piece that Bishop Fob has mentioned, this is the last one in a series of three. And the first two talk specifically about how do we have those conversations. So I appreciate you uh, sort of re reminding us and pointing back to that. I think as a, as a sort of a follow up is something that was interesting that you brought up is this idea that people have different, they're at different points on this conversation. Exactly. And even in a parish community or in a religious community or whatever community of, of common church people are, they're going to be at different points. How do we help those who, on the one hand, have never had this conversation before, be able to open and have these casual, or, you know, not casual, but very important and very challenging conversations? And on the other hand, how do we help the people who have been fighting this fight for, you know, decades at this point, 
not become discouraged at the slow, slow level of progress in this area. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, you know, I, I guess with those who have been in the fight a long time, I would, I would say, you know, we did not um, wake up this morning and have a problem with racism. Racism has been around for a long, long, long time. And there is no way that in a moment we are going to dismantle it. But we can be better tomorrow than we are today. And hopefully we're better today than we were yesterday. You know, um, and I think that that's what we have to remember. We are on a journey. And I think the current um, atmosphere surrounding racism and discussions regarding racism um, we have to remember this could be a watershed moment and and to know that we are part of the process you know my favorite one of my favorite sayings of dr martin luther king is though we might have to accept a finite disappointment we must not lose infinite hope so for those who've been in this fight a long time we might have to accept finite disappointment but we cannot lose infinite hope for those who are new I, I simply invite them, you know, they may be more comfortable beginning by reading a document such as Open Wide Our Hearts and then coming to a discussion uh, discussion group using the study guide. So I, I think we have, to, we have to recognize both. And those who are farther along the journey are, are called and constructed in positive ways to, to help those who are just beginning this journey. And those who are just beginning this journey, you know, there's a wisdom to those who have been in this struggle for a long time and seek to learn from that wisdom. So I think we, we support one another and we, we, you know, we recognize where each other is. That, that would be my response. Um, you mentioned a, a lot of times Open Wider Hearts, which I think is, a, is an excellent document from the bishops to, to speak on this topic and speak on, on some of these elements. And I think one of the most important elements that the, the introduction and towards the beginning talks about is the importance of, of sharing stories and listening. Would you like to speak a little bit about that and why that is such an important thing for us when we're, we're talking about racism and, and racial inequity and in, injustice in particular? Because Jesus recognized the power of stories. That's why he told parables. You know, here's an example. If someone were to ask you about your grandfather, and you gave, my grandfather was born on this day, my grandfather, you know, went to this school, my grandfather did this, my grandfather married this, my grandfather you know, fought in this war, my grandfather, you know, uh, struggle with these illnesses, my grandfather died on this day. Well, that's information about your grandfather. But if you want to teach somebody about your grandfather, you begin by saying, let me tell you a story about my grandfather, how I learned something from him. Here's another example. I encourage right after the um, killing of George Floyd, people in, in the diocese from Thibodeau, to ask someone racially different from you, particularly a person of color, how did the death of George Floyd make you feel? Or just, you know, not what they thought about it, but what, what, what did you feel? What was in your heart? There's one lady who said, you know, I decided Bishop to, to, to engage in a conversation with a woman of color, a person of color. This was a Caucasian woman. And she said, you know, we began talking about our teenage children. And she said, I was sharing with this mother, how I was getting, I'm getting ready to buy a car for my son. And she said, and I thought, thank God, you know, just trying to make conversation with her. Thank God, I'm going to not have to shuttle him all over town anymore. He's going to be able to get there by himself. And my life will be my own again. And he can go where he needs to go and I'll have some more freedom. And she said, Bishop, this other mother, woman of color looked at me and said, well, that's true. And she said, my son is getting ready to get a car as well. And she said, and I am terrified, terrified of the first time he gets stopped by the police. She said, I don't mean anything bad by that. I don't mean the police are bad, but I'm just terrified of what might happen. And the Caucasian mother said, I got it, Bishop. I got it. As a mother to a mother, I understood what she was talking about and how my experience of my son getting a car was different from 
her experience of her son getting a car. And she said, and it just clicked and I understood. That's why we have to listen to people's stories, not to wallow in it, but so that we might speak heart to heart and gain a deeper understanding that Jesus knew from, from using the parables to teach people, as I said. There's a deeper meaning to the parables and a deeper meaning to our story. So that's why it's very important that we listen heart to heart and come to know people by their stories. One of the questions that was asked a little couple times is this question of, uh, and I'll paraphrase it a little bit but, and expand upon it a little bit, but this idea of people that we acknowledge as being harboring racist attitudes or racist tendencies, how do we, the person asked like, how, what do we do with them? I'm gonna expand it upon it a little bit of, as Catholics, we are called to love our neighbor. That is one of you know Christ's commandments yes. or understanding. And so how do, we, how do we deal with this if the person does harbor you know, racist attitudes and bring them closer to God in that same sense? Mm -hmm. I think, um, I don't, this is me personally, uh, I would simply invite them to reflect upon what they have done or said. You know, uh, usually if someone harbors racist thoughts or, or is prejudiced, it's going to come out, you know, in one way or another, by what, what they say and do. And I think when we see that, we have to be courageous enough to look at the person and say, have you ever reflected on where that comment or where that action comes from within you? What might that manifest? Is it a struggle with people who are different racially? You know, to just lay it before them and say, you know, if the shoe fits, wear it, you know, and, and try to get another pair of shoes because that's that one is problematic, you know. Um, so I think we, we, we simply invite them. We encounter them where they are and, and, and lovingly lay it before them and simply say, have you ever reflected on? And if they say yes, you know, I don't like people who are different from me, then we have an open door to start talking about, you know, well, you know, let's talk about that and hopefully you know, let me share some things with you and then enter into dialogue with them. And, and that's when we are then able at that time to work on a conversion of heart. Now, the conversion of heart is ultimately that person's decision. We can only foster that. They have to decide to do it or not. But I think we begin by inviting people to reflect upon where did that come from or, or what did that say? And that is more often than not in our own homes, with our own family because they drop their guards. Family members drop their guards when they're with family members, you know. So that might be the place where we are called to do that the most. I, this is also sort of a follow-up, but a continuation of some of the conversation, and I'll read some of it verbatim. Is there a point where having the conversation, bringing it up too frequently makes things worse rather than better? How do we keep from crossing the line from making people uncomfortable to making people back away from these conversations on race? Well, my first response is people are always going to be uncomfortable. <laughs> you know, um, people are always going to be uncomfortable talking about uh, issues of, of race. So we cannot make that our standard, whether or not people are, are uncomfortable. I do think um, we have to recognize where people are. And this is where they're at. And I am not going to be able to force them to take the next step. All I can do is continue to invite. You know, it might be uncomfortable, but I continue in positive and constructive ways to invite. Racism is not the unforgivable sin. Racism can be forgiven. Racism can be healed. It is not an unforgivable sin. And I think, you know, that's something else we need to, to remember. And but so we're going to make people uncomfortable. But I think we have to remember that people take one step at a time, you know, and, and uh, we don't want to to turn them off. We want them reflecting and pondering in their mind and in their hearts. What does this mean for me? 
and helping them to take that next step. Um, I just wanted to, I have a couple of questions I had uh, written down and we have time for like one or two more questions. So I wanted to, to ask, what does injustice look like in a small way that we need to understand as something sinful or unjust? And so there, there are a couple of questions asked about the nature of sin and racism, um, in, especially in the, the sense of uh, unconscious or subconscious uh, acts of racism. How do we, how do we, how do we navigate that? How do we identify that as as being sinful? Mm -hmm. I think those those acts of of racism are moments between us and God. And do I even recognize that as wrong, as a sin? You know, do as as perpetuating the evil uh, and and uh, and uh, and sin of racism. You know, right? And I'm all by myself, do I even say, you know, Lord, I know, I know that's wrong. Help me to get beyond that. Um, so I think, you know, it's ultimately, as we stand on this before our own, our own hearts and before our own God, do we recognize, we recognize uh, how we are perpetuating things by what we, by what we say and do. I hope that answers the question. No, I, I think it does. Um, and I think as sort of a last, uh, question I think would be helpful. Um, what, besides the con opening up these conversations, what's one other piece that you would like our, our listeners and the watchers of this presentation like to, would you like them to know and understand as a sort of a brief takeaway uh, to sort of wrap us up? I think two things to know that, as I said, racism harms its victims. Racism also harms those who perpetuate it. Um, and I do think, finally, if this can be a moment that will be pointed back to, hopefully, in future history, as a moment where this was a watershed moment, where we really, finally took the next step with regard to dealing with racism. You know, I think civil rights legislation, as I said, began to deal with racism and, okay, we live together. But obviously, there's something missing. I'm not, we have come a long way, but there's still something missing. Why? Because we're still struggling with racism. Even though we have equality before law, you know, let's posit that and everything like that. I really think it's because it has not come from our hearts. You know, that's where evil comes from, from within a person. So we thank God for civil laws, but at the same time, you know, we have to, desire, uh, you know, what Martin Luther King called the beloved community, when we do the right thing, not because the law, not only because the law tells us, but because it's the right thing to do. We become that beloved community. So I, I'm hoping this can be a watershed moment for us to begin to journey also into the next part of this, which is conversion of hearts, as the bishop stated, while also working on policy and laws and things of that nature. I think that is an excellent point to end on. So I wanna thank you, Bishop Bob, for your presentation and to thank you to everyone who's tuned in with us today. Uh, we'll have a recording of this webinar uploaded to catholicapostlecenter.org or siconnect.org, hopefully within the next week. Um, and then those resources are, share, are free to share. I'd also like to thank uh, Beth Davis from SLI Connect for her collaboration throughout the series, and a special thank you to the ACTA Foundation that has generally su generously supported this whole series for the formation of Catholic leaders on this topic. Again, Bishop Fob, thank you again for your presentation, and I hope you all have a good day. Thank you. God bless.